Chapters 19 and 20 of Life and Adventures of Jack Engel, an Autobiography by Walt Whitman. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 19. Some Hours in an Old New York Churchyard, Where I Am Led to Investigations and Meditations. In the earliest chapter of my life, speaking of Wigglesworth, I alluded to the melancholy spectacle of old age, down at the heel, which we so often see in New York, the aged remnants of former respectability and vigor, the seedy clothes, the forlorn and half-starved aspect, the lonesome mode of life when wealth and kindred had alike decayed or deserted. Such thoughts recurred naturally again to my mind as I and the old landlord descended from the hired hack and entered the gates of Trinity Church to pay the last honors to the body of poor Wigglesworth, who, at a heavy cost, had the one engrossing wish to be buried there with his mother. For his family, particularly on the maternal side, was of considerable rank, reduced as the old man had become. May the aged clerk rest in peace there, in that vault, in the midst of the clang and hubbub of the mighty city, which surrounds him on all sides. For his was a good nature, and from first to last he had proved my firm friend. I often imagine him, even now that time has mellowed down his appearance, I often imagine him to be again shuffling around, his lips caved in upon a mouth bereft of teeth, white, thin hair, his bent shoulders, his spectacles, and his dismally warm clothes. Again, I say, may he rest in peace there in the venerable churchyard. The better feeling of our times has created ample and tasteful cemeteries, at a proper distance from the turmoil of the town. The elegant and somber greenwood, unsurpassed probably in the world for its chaste and appropriately sober beauty, the varied and wooded slopes of the cemetery of the evergreens, and the elevated and classic simplicity of Cypress Hills, and correct sanitary notions have properly made interments in the city limits illegal, prohibiting them by a fine which is heavy enough to form an effectual bar, except in cases, as occasionally happens even yet, of a strong desire to be buried in a spot hallowed by past associations and the presence of ancestors, with an ability to pay the fine. Still, the few old graveyards that lie in some of the busiest parts of our city are not without their lesson, and a valuable one. On the occasion of the old man's scanty funeral, after the others had departed and I was left alone, I spent the rest of that pleasant golden forenoon one of the finest days in our American autumn, wandering slowly through the Trinity graveyard. I felt in the humor, serious without deep sadness, and I went from spot to spot and sometimes copied the inscriptions. Long, rank grass covered my face. Over me was the verdure, touched with brown, of trees nourished from the decay of bodies of men, the tombstone nearest me held this inscription, James M. Baldwin, aged twenty-two years, wounded on Lake Champlain. By the date of the time of his wound, and also that of his death, both of which were given on the stone, I knew that the latter took place about a year after the first. Here, then, lay one of the Republic's faithful children, faithful to death. Was it, for I felt in amusing vein, hard for him to die, hung round about his prospects a gay-colored future. Twenty-two, that was my own age, and of death I shuddered instinctively at the thought, for I felt that life, matter-of-fact as it was and is in reality, I felt that to me it opened enjoyment and pleasure on every side. I was happy in my friends, happy in having Ephraim and Violet and Tom and Martha and Inez, every one of them. I was happy that I lived in this glorious New York, 
where, if one goes without activity and enjoyment, it must be his own fault in the main. Truly, life is sweet to the young man. Such bounding and swelling capacities for joy reside within him, and such ambitious yearnings. Health and unfettered spirits are his staff and mantle. He learns unthinkingly to love that glorious privilege of youth. Out of the tiny fractions of his experience, he builds beautiful imaginings and confidently looks for the future to realize them. And then he is so sure of those future years. Was not probably such the spirit of the young man whose grave I now sat on, the shroud and the coffin for him? Alas, so it was ordained. For nearly a year fever burned his blood, and sharp pains racked him, and then came the dismissal of oblivion. In the northern part of the old graveyard I found the tombs of a father and mother, natives of New York, with a numerous family of their children. Happily, the whole of the chain, unbroken, was there. Various, as I saw by the dates, were the periods of their dying. They had all been brought here at last, some of them, no doubt, from distant places, and were there moldering, but together. Human souls are as the dove, which went forth from the ark and wandered far, and would repose herself at last on no spot save that whence she started. To what purpose has nature given men this instinct to die where they were born? Exist there some subtle sympathy between the thousand mental and physical essences which make up a human being and the sources wherefrom they are derived? Another inscription I found in the graveyard read thus, Edward Marshall died 1704. The stone was low and uneven. The words appeared to have been obliterated by time and then traced out again by some kindly hand. 1704. At the time when these paragraphs are being printed, nearly a century and a half ago. Of the generations then upon the earth, probably not a person is living. What great events have happened, too, since that time? A nation of free men has arisen, outstripping all ever before known in happiness, good government, and real grandeur. And even that star of Corsica, which flitted like a glaring phantom across the world, now lies in no warmer a tomb, splendid as it is in the gay capital of France, than the one covered by that brown and age-decayed slab. Near the wall that divides the yard from Rector Street, I stopped by the grave of a man who, in his time, was the sower of seeds that have brought forth good and evil. The burial stone tells the following story. To the memory of Alexander Hamilton. The Corporation of Trinity Church have erected this monument in testimony of their respect for the patriot of incorruptible integrity, the soldier of approved valor, the statesman of consummate wisdom, whose talents and virtues will be admired by a grateful posterity, long after this marble shall have moldered into dust. The circumstances of the death of Hamilton, which took place on July 12, 1804, are well known. He was forty-seven years old. On the day of his funeral, the common council, the militia, the clergy, the bar, and the society of the Cincinnati, with a mass of citizens convened in Park Place, and while dire wishes of vengeance rankled in many a bosom, moved in solemn procession down Broadway to Trinity Church, where Governor Morris mounted a stage and erected in the portico, and delivered a funeral oration. The grief of Hamilton's family, who were present, seemed contagious. Every eye was wet with tears. I may here add that I have once to twice in my time met the still-living widow of the dead man, a lady whose aged form is constantly busied in works of kindness and benevolence. 
Nearer to Broadway is a broad, square, simply elegant mausoleum, on the slab of which is graved, My Mother. The trumpet shall sound, and the dead shall rise. A sweet epitaph, and the manifestation of a most sweet motive. In the farther corner of the yard was a ruined tomb, the bricks fallen down, and the hole partly covered by a rough pine shed. But read the history inscribed upon it, in memory of Captain James Lawrence of the U.S. Navy, who fell on the first day of June, 1813, in the thirty-second year of his age, in the action between the frigates Chesapeake and Shannon. He had distinguished himself on various occasions, but particularly while commanding the sloop of war Hornet, by capturing and sinking His British Majesty's sloop of war Peacock, after a desperate action of fourteen minutes. His bravery in action was only equaled by his modesty in triumph, and his magnanimity to the vanquished. In private life, he was a gentleman of the most generous and endearing qualities, and so acknowledged was his public worth that the whole nation mourned his loss, and the enemy contended with his countrymen who should do him honor. On the opposite side, the here whose remains are here deposited with his dying breath expressed his devotion to his country, neither the fury of the battle, the anguish of a mortal wound, nor the horrors of approaching death could subdue his gallant spirit. His dying words were, Don't give up the ship. In the present condition of the church and grounds, the remains of Lawrence had been removed from their distant corner, and now occupy a new and appropriate tomb, close by Broadway, at the immediate left of the lower gate. The foregoing inscription has been transferred literally, and the posts at the corners of the new tomb are formed of cannon planted there. Lawrence, the brave ideal of such as I, of all American young men, what a day must that have been when he drew out of Boston Harbor, and the hearts of his countrymen beat high with the confidence of victory. What a moment when, struck down by the enemy's fire, enveloped in smoke and blood, the sounds and sights of carnage around him on every side, he was borne from the deck, overcome but not conquered, his last thought, his last gasp, given for his country— Taken by generous victors to Halifax, his corpse was treated with those testimonials of illustrious merit which became his exalted courage, and the character of a people never niggard in their admiration of true patriotism. But not long could his beloved republic spare the remains of a child so dear to her, and so fit to be a copy for her children. His body was brought to New York, and here the people buried him. Even his nearest friends wept not. Their hearts were not sad, but joyful. The flag he died for wrapped his coffin, and he was lowered in that native earth whose boast is that she has nurtured such brave defenders as himself. Sleep gently, bold sailor, nor let it be thought presumptuous that many a youth of America wandering near your ashes, feels that he could wish to emulate your devotion to your native land. More and more enamored with these researches, I continued strolling for hours in the old place. Since the settlement of our island, this spot has never been used for any other than religious purposes. Before 1696, there was but one Episcopal church here, and that, until 1740, the time of the Negro plot, when it was burned, stood in the fort, now one of the favorite public grounds, the Battery. In 1696, Trinity was built. In 1737, it was enlarged, and in 1776, it was burnt down in the great fire which destroyed a thousand homes, just after the Battle of Brooklyn, the city falling into the hands of the British. In 1788, when the country had become somewhat settled from the Revolution, Trinity Church was rebuilt, 
its dimensions being a hundred and one feet by seventy-four, a great size for those days. But the immense wealth of the church corporation and the gigantic progress of the city encouraged the officers, it is, when this statement is read, not many years ago, to pull down what was not yet an old edifice and erect the costly and superb pile that certainly forms one of the finest pieces of architecture in the new world. While pursuing my meditations, the noon had passed, and the after half of the day crept onward, and it was time for me to close my ramble and move homeward. I put my pencil in the slip of paper on which I had been copying in my pocket, and took one slow and last look around, ere I went forth again into the city, and to resume my interest in affairs that lately so crowded upon me. Out there in the fashionable thoroughfare, how bustling was life, and how jauntily it wandered close along the side of those warnings of its inevitable end. How gay that throng along the walk! Light laughs come from them, and jolly talk, those groups of well-dressed young men, those merry boys returning from school, clerks going home from their labors, and many a form, too, of female grace and elegance. Could it be that coffins, six feet below where I stood, enclosed the ashes of like young men, whose vestments during life had engrossed the same anxious care, and schoolboys and beautiful women, for they too were buried here, as well as the aged and infirm. But onward rolled the broad, bright current, and troubled themselves not yet with gloomy thoughts. And that showed more philosophy in them, perhaps, than such sentimental meditations as any the reader has been perusing. CHAPTER Twenty. I SPEND AN EVENING IN THE PERUSAL OF THE MANUSCRIPT. NOT A WORD FROM COVERT. WAS NOT THE SILENCE OMINOUS? BUT ANYWAY, MARTHA WAS OUT OF HIS POWER, AND WE HAD THAT IMPORTANT POSSESSION, WHICH IS NINE POINTS OF THE LAW. EPHRAM HEARD FROM HOBOKEN IN THE COURSE OF THE DAY. ALL WENT SMOOTHLY THERE. NATHANIEL CAME IN ON HIS WAY HOME TO SAY THAT THE OFFICE with the exception of himself and his dog, was quite deserted, he also having received from his master no word or command that day. I did not altogether like this stillness, for I feared Covert's craft, and that there might be something behind of which I was not yet aware. My reflections convinced me, however, that there was no better course for our side than to keep quiet and let the enemy make his move for himself. The hour was yet early when I retired to my room that night and placed my lamp on the table. I had been pretty seriously impressed with the occurrences of the past few days and with the reflections in the graveyard of Old Trinity. I took from the drawer where I had deposited it the manuscript written by the unfortunate father of the Quakeress, for I felt that I was in a fitting temper to read it. When I had removed the envelope and opened it, I found the manuscript written in a hasty and often scrawling manner, evidently under the influence of excitement. It was upon the strong, stiff paper used many years since, and still remained in perfect preservation. That it interested me completely, and that I felt a deep sympathy for the unfortunate gentleman who had committed it to paper is certain." Time and his punishment obliterated anything that might otherwise have been resentment in my feelings toward him, and his story came to me more like something I might read in a book. The tone of the narrative is morbid, but under the circumstances that must of course be expected. Narrative of Martha's Father Whoever you are, into whose hands this dismal story may fall, Oh, let me hope that my daughter may read it and drop a tear for her parent, whoever you are, whether daughter, friend, or stranger, I begin my narrative, written in prison, to while away the heavy hours and leave the chance of one little legacy of sympathy for myself, 
by a command. Look around you on the beautiful earth, the free air, sky, fields, and streets, the people swarming in all directions. All this is common, you say. It is not worth a thought, I once supposed thus, like you. But I suppose so no longer. Now all these things seem to me the most beautiful objects in the world. To be free, to walk where you will, to look on freedom, to be free from care too, by which I mean not to have your soul pressed down by the weight of horrible odium or disgrace, not to have a dreadful punishment hanging over you. Oh, that is happiness. Happiness. Alas, what absurdities pass among men under the name. Happiness. I am in prison, with death perhaps waiting for me, and I write some of my thoughts on happiness. Is there, indeed, no specific for the enjoyment of life? Come we here on earth but to toil and sorrow, to eat, drink, and beget children, to sicken and die? In that world, the heart of man, glisten no sun-rays and bloom no blossoms as in the outer world? And love and ambition and intellect and wealth, fountains whence, in youth, we expect the future years to draw so much of this happiness, as their fruition comes, does not disappointment also come? I would that the devil in the Garden of Eden had been made to tell the young man that it was that what it was that led to felicity, that in these modern days the pursuits in which men engage with so much ardor, the men all around us do not reach it, is evidence. Wealth cannot purchase it. The newspapers every month contain accounts of individuals assuredly prosperous in all their pecuniary affairs, and some think them young and healthy, who in the very midst of what the poor think perfect bliss have committed self-murder. The successful seeker after rank and place is not happy, not from that success, at least. The most learned scholars are often the most melancholy men in the world. Beauty grieves and pines as much as the brain which wears a homely face. Elegant dress frequently covers a sick soul, and the furniture of a handsome carriage may be but the trappings of misery. Then, among the busier and more laboring kinds of people, the same general absence of happiness prevails. It seems reasonable that he whose existence is one uninterrupted struggle to keep off starvation by slavery and hard work at that should see but few bright days. But the man whose labors are effectual fares little better. The mechanic, the plowman, the literary drudge are alike debarred from any delicious experience of that sweet morsel we so much prize but never obtain. I am speaking now not of the goodly gratifications of sense or everyday tastes which are common enough, but of the attainment at any time to that condition when a man can say to himself, I feel perfect bliss, I have no desire ungratified, Am I not philosophic here in my graded walls? Do you not see how keen my sight has become? And truly it is a consolation in this sort to think what a miserable world it is. But I would not be miserable if I had one great weight off my soul and were at liberty again. Now, when I am nigh leaving life, my eyes are just opened to its beauty. Oh, what a cheap and common beauty! To be free and not to be a criminal, for I have now also removed the greatest bar that once stood between me and happiness. That was a fiery temper. 
I have lost that now. I feel that if I should live a hundred years, they would be a hundred years without anger or revenge. How wild, how disconnected are my thoughts. How I talk of a hundred years. Shall I see yet half a hundred days? A fiery temper grew up in me from my birth. My boyhood was fierce and uncontrolled. My home was not worthy the name. I had no home. Although parents cared enough for me to spend money liberally and give me an almost unlimited indulgence that way, yet they did not furnish me what is most wanted from parents, good example, good counsel, and a true home roof. I was boarded almost from the beginning away in the country, for I had such a stormy temper, and my mother was nervous, and the servants would not stand it. And the father, ah, uh, he meddled himself with no such things, and did not even want to be spoke to about them. Was he not at all the expense? Could he not fairly count that enough? Besides, I was to inherit his property. That must satisfy me. It were too much to expect that he should give up his time for my education and the shaping of my character. Even the death of my mother, which occurred when I was a half-grown boy, made no difference in his treatment. Such are what the world calls good parents, for they do not beat their children nor starve them. They leave them estates, too, and what does a child want more than money? When I grew up to be a young man, I was rude, boisterous, and ungovernable. Already I had fallen into many scrapes from my violent temper, but they were none of them hard enough to teach me the great lesson I needed. My temper was made, indeed, rather more unbearable from them, for I emerged victorious after all. One gleam of sunshine came across my life, and for a time subdued me into gentler condition. Love tamed me from my roughness. She was herself a being of peace and calmness, she whom I loved, and her influence brought into my temperament something of the same soothing qualities. She was of Quaker family, and perhaps it was that the very tameness to which she had been accustomed gave my free and independent manner the charm of freshness to her taste, for my affection was returned truly and faithfully. She did not chance to see the worst phases of my character. Her presence was soothing and pacifying, for never did I dissemble. I acted always as I felt, and had the occasion provoked not even the knowledge of what an ungracious look it would possess in her eyes could have kept down my rebellious temper. My father had an attack of illness at this time, which, in the course of a few weeks, was pronounced hopeless. I did not mourn, for what reason had I? He called me to him before he died, and at the eleventh hour gave me some good advice. Some good advice, some words. Doubtless they were very valuable, those words, but they were nothing but words. After the tree has grown up, with the bend in its trunk and the shape of its branches formed, would it do to stand before it and preach a sermon of good advice? Would it change that bend or the gnarled branches? But a few months passed away after my father's death when I found myself married and comfortably settled. Ah, those were my happiest days. These tears that roll down my cheeks while I write attest it. They are not bitter tears. The time of which they are the remembrance is the only gleam of pure light in the course of my past career of cloudy, checkered fortune. And sweet as it was, that long-continued honeymoon, the saving freshness it brings to me now is perhaps the most beautiful part of it. It illumines this prison cell. It bestows a charmed atmosphere even in these sad and somber walls. A child, too, blessed our marriage, a fair daughter. 
may she be blessed in her life with something of that blessing which she brought to us. May she live, and when she looks back on these dismal days, and the tears drop for her ill-fated father, ah, then perhaps the story of my life will have its office in her mind." I commenced this document with some gloomy thoughts on happiness, but gloomy as they are, and fitted for my present situation, I am almost tempted to blot them out. The memory of the twenty months that followed my marriage is a full denial of him who would say there is no happiness on earth. Surely my good genius was in the ascendant all that time. Oh, how soon was it to be followed by a thunderstroke? There was a man of my own age, but poor and hardy, whom I had known while we were boys together, when I was boarding in the country. He had in many things been my friend, but, even when youngsters, we frequently quarreled, for he would never submit to my domineering temper. He belonged to what are termed the common classes, and, as I had wealth, Perhaps it was that which separated us afterward, for I met him often in the city to which he had himself come, and was earning his living in a poor way. Illiterate, hard-working, and married to an ordinary and rather shiftless woman, he was not much worse off when his wife died and left him a widower with a little infant son. My evil genius it was that put this man in my way. His hard life had formed him to a temper as morose as mine was fiery. He occupied part of a mean dwelling, close in the neighborhood of my own costly residence, and various causes conspired to bring us into contact. I had not thought of it before, but it seemed to me now, notwithstanding the little services of friendship which he had performed for me, that there had always been some seeds of antipathy between us. He made sarcastic remarks about my appearance and manners. He thought I was, from vulgar pride, unwilling to acknowledge the former intimacy with him. He was mistaken in the cause, although right in his conclusion. I gave out a contract to make some additions and repairs on my premises, and this man was engaged by the contractor in a laboring capacity among his workmen. I was too proud to utter a word about it, but his appearance was greatly annoying to me. He took a bitter advantage, too, of the position he had relative to mine, and often I was conscious of his sneers and jibs as I passed along, followed by the suppressed laughter of the workmen. This was all a trifle, it may seem, and so indeed it was. But that man made to me, the Jew sitting in the king's gate, a living mockery to my pride. One time, when his remarks were coldly insolent to my face, I swore to him that if he repeated his unprovoked outrages, I would dash him to the earth. He laughed tauntingly, but at the time replied not a word, I was unconscious, at the while, that I cut a poor figure before the men who surrounded us, and that added to my vexation. A few days later, oh, dismal hour, I went through the newly building part with the boss, giving directions and receiving explanations of the proposed work. We had got through talking, and I was about to leave the place when I heard one of this man's sarcasms upon me upon my pride, and even about some peculiarities of my person. The boss had left, unfortunately, although the workmen were all around. I suppressed my anger, which was suddenly rising, and even turned to leave the place. I had to pass my enemy on the way. He enjoyed his triumph, and just as I was passing him, he coolly and deliberately spoke to me words of still deeper and more provoking influence than ever he had uttered before, and directly addressed them to me with the evident design of cutting me to the quick. My blood was already afire in my veins, and this maddened me. I hardly remember now with sufficient distinctness what passed. 
I think I had gone a couple of steps beyond where the man stood, but the fury was too much then. I turned, made one spring upon him, and, in the rage of my anger, wrenched from his hand the mallet he had been working with, and dealt him a blow directly on the top of the head. My arm was unnaturally nerved by an insane ferocity. It was the stroke of death. He fell like a log, and I stood there a murderer. The ensuing few hours are like a hateful and confused dream to me. I was neither asleep nor awake. I felt a sort of numbness, and remember closing and shutting my eyes incessantly. I did not stir from the spot during the horror and the outcries and hurry and dread of the immediate half-hour that followed the murder. I stood and looked on the poor fellow's body, and I thought, strangely enough, of us two, when we were boys together, when we had often gone out fishing and swimming and gunning together. I thought of the services he had done me, and remembered what a brave boy he was, and how, in any trouble, he never deserted me then, but stood as staunch as steel. Even the little incidents of our country life came up before me, our friendship, the fences where we crossed, the orchards, the shores, the old leaky scow, the hickory poles that were used for fishing rods. Could it be that I, now, was the murderer of that boy? Even the thought of my own condition and of my wife and little daughter were crowded aside by such remembrances as these. They came slowly and turgidly floating through the current of my mind. A wild, despairing shriek. It rings in my ears now, roused me from my reverie. Oh, that terrible cry! It was the agony of a broken-hearted wife, of a soul crushed to powder by one stroke. She breathed my name, whispered it faintly and lovingly. Her ghastly face, with a frightful dampness upon it, turned toward me, and yearningly in the weakness of her sinews, endeavored to reach up to my own sweating features. I lifted her, pressed one long, tight kiss upon her lips, and then resigned her inanimate form to those who bore her to the bed where she lay unconscious of life or sorrow for twice twenty hours. Then this pure-souled creature died as a flower might wilt of a chilly evening, silently and without complaint. I made no effort to escape, and I think I did not utter a word to the officers who guarded me to prison. An awful blank seemed to spread through the mental part of me, cold, cold as ice, without any action or object or warmth. It was not painful, at least not beyond a dull, deadened sense of something like fullness which oppressed my head. One hour! What a change it had made for me! I was not treated with any roughness, either by the crowd who gathered quickly to the spot or by the policemen. Some of the workpeople gave a true statement of the insolence of the poor fellow I had slain, and how it was done in the sudden fury of the moment. They made the case as favorable to me as they could, and the appearance and overwhelmed sorrow of my poor wife completed the work of compassionate feeling toward me. Tears fell down many a weather-beaten cheek, and haply many a silent prayer was offered up for the wretched young man whose days were darkened with even a drearier fate than had befallen the poor victim there. And so I was in prison a murderer. For my wife's death I felt no deep regret. To die was less grief than to live, I knew, in her case. Ah, uh, was it not so in my own? The law, which is often cruel in minor accusations, is seldom so in great ones. I have been treated fairly and honorably here in my prison. 
whatever indulgence could properly be given has not been denied me. There is a noble pity that frequently actuates jailers and officers of the law toward the wretched ones who come under their charge, on their path to heavy punishment. A pity, beautiful and honorable to their characters, and showing well in them. This compassion I experienced throughout, and it made me think better of my kind. After the first deadening, numbing night passed, the next morning, when the day dawned upon me here where I am now writing, I was a changed man. I felt composed enough, and indeed was without any of that anxious dread which might be supposed natural to one in my situation. At the same time, I was fully conscious of that situation. It was all present to me, and I comprehended every point of it. The crime, its legal punishment, the poor victim, my family, the lamentable violence of my former temper, the scene and incidents of the murder, the best points in my behalf, all were clearly arrayed before my thought. My former temper, I say, for I looked back now upon that as pertaining to a separate existence. I knew that, under any conceivable circumstances, it was mine no longer. The serpent had cast his slough. A legal agent, whom I had formerly employed, I picked out from several whose names I turned over in my mind, and sent for him. Much to my sorrow, he was absent on a voyage of considerable distance. An answer to this effect has been brought me by a lawyer who, some years ago, had studied, he tells me, in the office of the absent attorney. Would it not be a good thought to engage this man, for some of my small commissions at least? I questioned myself. His countenance is impassive, but he is a Quaker, and that fact recommends him to me. I have commissioned the man, whose name is Covert, to see to the decent burial of my poor victim, and have given him written authority and command of funds for that, and a few other purposes. Many of my hours are occupied with the arrangement of my worldly affairs, for there has come to me a notion amounting to a certainty that I am dying. Friends to whom I have mentioned the sphere endeavor to chase it away by saying that it is the result of my brooding thoughts, and that such vagaries often come into the minds of people under a great dread. I do not answer them, but I feel none the less the certainty of my death, nor is it painful to me. Here a blank, the next part of the manuscript being on another page. My will has been duly drawn up with minuteness. I have left the bulk of my fortune to my daughter, and a goodly portion of it, properly secured, to the child of my victim. Covert comes to see me every day. He strongly advises me to make preparations for my trial, to engage the best legal talent, and so forth. He almost sneers at me when I answer that nothing of the sort is needed. He is a doubtful creature. This, neither old nor young lawyer, I hardly know what to make of him. Upon the whole, however, I have concluded to trust him. He is now thoroughly advised of my intentions and affairs. I am particularly induced to make him my friend, for his wife, much older than himself, who is gentle and good, if there be any such qualities on earth, has shown the tenderest affection for my little child, whom she has consented to take charge of. She has no children, and treats my poor helpless one with all a mother's affection. The day approaches. I have made all my preparations, and I feel now calmer than at any time since I have dwelt in this prison. Should I think of anything more, I will add it. If not, let whoever reads this dark story know that I experience, while I write, more composure and rest than any day I recall during the years of my ordinary life, with the exception of my marriage time. I do not doubt that I am dying. My little daughter, may heaven protect her unprotected childhood. 
may God pity me, and may I continue to feel this soothing calm to the last. Here was a long blank, and the paragraph that follows was written evidently by another hand at another time. The prayer uttered in the last lines by my dear and unfortunate friend was not in vain. He retained his equanimity, and his forebodings were strangely verified. The day set down for his trial found him dead. That very day he was committed to the grave. He charged me with the narrative he had written, and intended for his daughter, should she live, as he had every confidence she would, and grow to womanhood. The remaining part of the paper, which filled several pages, in the same hand as the last paragraph, consisted of some references, legal data, and religious advice, all of which would not be of interest. End of chapter 20《Chapters 21 and 22 of Life and Adventures of Jack Engel, an Autobiography by Walt Whitman. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 21. Setting forth the conduct of Mr. Covert when he found himself in a tight place. The foiled lawyer. The fox caught in a trap while he thought he had so nicely fixed traps for others. It was not an agreeable picture to look upon, but I will portray it, as I afterward learnt to my satisfaction, the reality transpired. Covert did not know of Martha's departure till early in the morning, but then his suspicious soul immediately felt that something was wrong, and something serious, too. It was never the custom for Martha to leave the house in that way, and where had she to go without informing him? Sick before, and now doubly sick with alarm, he instinctively hobbled to what he supposed the safe repository of his valuable plunder, supposed, and yet had an indefinite sort of fear. Miserable, pale wretch! There was something in the electric shock of despair and baffled selfishness, condensed in that first minute of confusion, to revenge upon you the scores of villainies you had perpetrated, commencing with the swindle of the poor carpenter. That long life of lies and cheats for gain came like a flash before him. And now, after all, to be foiled. With trembling hands, his forehead running a chill sweat, the lawyer commenced turning out everything— Perhaps he had misplaced the precious documents, and they were there yet. He ransacked, high and low. He went over the search again, and dropping his cane, for he felt an unnatural strength suddenly come into his weakened veins, he began a systematic search through the room in its every part. He was desperate indeed. What chance was there? No matter. He finished that room— and then went over the next in the same manner, and then the next. At last he ascended to Martha's apartment. Her furniture and many of her things were there, as formerly, but it was evident that she had made a careful selection of what she most needed, and those articles were taken away. He called up the servant from the kitchen. She was a stupid, half-witted girl, the only help he kept in the place. She could give him no information, for she had been soundly sleeping when Martha departed. Obtaining a messenger, he sent down at once to the office for me to come up to his house. Far from being at the office, I had, when I put my hat on my head the evening before, taken an oath never voluntarily to enter its doors again. My days of studying law, I felt, might as well come to an end. And since these revelations... Ephraim Foster did not seem to entertain the old obstinacy that way. "'After all, Jack,' he had said that morning, "'I don't know, but I was too fast in pushing you to this sort of life. The Lord forgive me if you should lose your honesty by it.' I seriously assured him that I could not answer for myself, that I had already felt a sort of nibbling disposition in the points of my fingers— Covert's messenger was instructed, in default of me, to bring up Wigglesworth, if he could be brought, 
or, as a last resort, the boy Nathaniel. Wigglesworth was on his deathbed, and thus it fell that my spirited young friend of the night before, whistling to his dog, coolly clapped his hat on his head and bade the messenger, whom he styled my son, although that personage was old enough to be his grandfather, go on before and convey to Mr. Covert an assurance of his love, and that he would be with the good man forthwith. Nathaniel, who locked the door and carried the key in his hand, had much to attract his attention on his journey. In the first place he came round to me, according to a previous arrangement, and told me that he had been sent for and was going. "'And it's my opinion,' said Nat, "'that I shall take the opportunity to let the old boy into a piece of my mind.' I cautioned him against mentioning the whereabouts of Martha just at present. With respect to any further information, he might say as much as he liked. He took his walk very leisurely, except where there was a provoking chance to have a race with Jack. There were the theater bills to read. These he perused with close attention from top to bottom. There were various turnouts in the street, particularly every trim and stylish nag attached to a buggy or sulky, the least bit of flash description. Of all the world such a possession was the envy and engrossing ambition of the boy's heart. He strained his eyes then as far as the horse could be seen. Since he had grown a little older, Nathaniel was not so pugnacious as formerly, and though he took an interest enough in any personal conflict that happened to fall under his attention, he felt no more the old itching to take part in it himself, unless where specially invited or called upon. When Nat arrived at Mr. Covert's house, he refused the girl's request to leave Jack out in the front area, unless his friend were admitted, he, Nathaniel, would not be persuaded to pass the door. He was shown into the room, and there he found himself face to face with Covert, and standing by the window were Ferris and the dandy Smythe. The feverish impatience of the lawyer could not be controlled, and fast upon the heels of the first messenger was dispatched a second, with order for those two worthies. "'Where's Angle?' said Covert to the boy at once. "'As near as I can tell,' answered Nat, "'Mr. Angle is at his residence, or dwelling. "'Wigglesworth, I hear, is very bad, no hopes of living.' Nat inclined his head. "'What's been going on at the office?' continued Covert, looking sharply at the boy. The young gentleman merely repeated the question. "'Yes, who's been there? Why is Engel not there? Do you know anything of Martha? Have you heard anything?' The excited lawyer hurried question upon question and sat down breathless. "'Well, now,' said Nat composedly, "'I guess you are flustered. Martha has left you, hasn't she?' Covert sprung from his seat again and made as if he would seize Nat bodily. The dog bristled up and uttered a low growl. "'It'll do no good to get flustered,' continued Nat. "'I know Martha's gone as well as you do, and I know she'll never come back again. And I know Mr. Engel will never come back again. And what do you say if I tell you that I am going and she'll never come back again?' "'It would be good riddance of an idle and impertinent young scamp,' said Covert sternly, although he now suppressed any more violent evidences of passion, and motioned the boy to the door, for he saw that he was going to get nothing from him. Nat, after daintily placing the key on the table, retired with a mock bow, wishing the lawyer better judgment of people's characters, and hoping he would begin to pass a pleasant night." as soon as it came dark. What passed in the conference between the three worthies who were left, I never learned. That they were, to a great extent, implicated together in plans of villainy, there is no doubt, and thus were bound to afford each other mutual help in time of need. The rest of that day and during the night, while we were expecting every moment to hear something from Covert and wondering why we did not, there was bustle and activity about the lawyer's house. Pepperidge Ferris and Smythe were in and out, in and out again, 
several times making long journeys up and down from the house to the office and from the office to the house. No help was called in from outside. A few little purchases were left at the door, where they were taken in by Smythe, and there was a noise of nailing up boxes and tumbling things from room to room. At the closing of the afternoon of the day subsequent to Nathaniel's visit, the same young gentleman, being then at leisure, happened to circulate through the very street again and in front of Covert's house, which he passed by on the opposite side. A carriage was waiting at the door, and the boy naturally stopped to see what it meant. Presently, down the steps came Mr. Covert, assisted by Ferris. He entered the carriage alone, and Nat saw that it was crowded with trunks and carpet-bags. Before the youngster well recovered from his astonishment, the driver was up on his box, and the hack dashed away at a rapid rate. Ferris deliberately ascended the steps, locked the door, tried it again to see if it was all right, went down and tried the basement door also, stood a moment on the walk in front, and scanned the tightly closed blinds, and then walked musingly away. Nat was at his wit's end to find a clue to Covert's destination, for the sharp-witted youth knew that I would in all probability be anxious to know. He accosted the woman of a little shop, in front of the spot whence he had observed these movements, but all that she knew, notwithstanding her curiosity, had also been on the alert, was that a big cart full of trunks and well-packed articles, taken away two hours before, was destined for the Albany boat. Nat sprang off at a venture for the pier region downtown, in hopes of getting further information. And never had Jack been more perseveringly rivaled in the race than this pleasant hour in the decline of the afternoon. The boy was too late to reach the boat. He saw the carriage, however, and promptly stopping the driver, who had deposited his passenger on board the steamer some fifteen minutes before, he learned that the trunks of that bilious and wrinkle-faced man, who seemed laboring under a restless excitement, and spoke so faintly, and trembled so much, were marked not only for Albany, but for a distant town in Canada. And covert, he heard asking one of the clerks of the boat, how long it would necessarily take him to reach that place, the best means of getting there, and the shortest possible time. Yes, the enemy fairly fled, and left us in possession of the field. And, strange as it may appear, we never heard anything definite from or about Covert after that departure. We never even knew whether he reached his destination alive. As to Pepperidge Jarvis and Smythe, they doubtless had good reasons for keeping closed tongues in their mouths. They would not favor the numerous anxious inquirers after their old friend with a single item of explanation, but swore that they didn't know what became of the runaway any more than other people. Chapter 22 In Which We All Get to the End of the Journey The History of My Adventures Draws to Its Conclusion I have not much more to tell, and that I will dispatch quickly. It was natural enough that the love which had its rise in my mind toward the young Quakeress should take a course usual in such matters, but I forego the infliction of a courtship on whoever has traveled with me thus far. My attachment was returned, and, in the few months after the last of the events already recorded, Violet, much to her satisfaction, gave my wedding supper to a few choice friends. The investigations of Wigglesworth had been so thorough, and he had so completely noted down, with date and volume and page, and every other particular, the links in the chain of evidence to substantiate the truth of Martha's rights, and of the history, as far as was needed in law, that has been narrated in the foregoing chapters, of the father and his death, together with his will and disposition of his property, all these were so minutely detailed and substantiated by references to authentic records of the courts and other unquestionable data that we found no difficulty in settling the whole matter to our satisfaction. Martha had no near relative, and the few distant ones of whom she had heard, 
and her being taken charge of by Mrs. Covert, who seems to have been the very antipodes of her husband. Even those faraway connections had lost sight of her, and she was left to depend much upon the good lady who, through her most helpless years, acted as her best friend and protector. The very means which the lawyer had hit upon to carry out his own wicked designs proved ultimately to be in our favor. I allude to the turning of so much of Martha's property into bonds and paper, as more convenient for transportation or concealment. The valuable bills and documents we had, in the manner before stated, secured possession of. That Covert made no attempt against his former ward after her flight is not perhaps surprising. He knew that she now had devoted friends, and that a legal investigation would result in an unavoidable exposure not at all to his credit. Besides, this would in all likelihood draw in its train other investigations and exposures involving his schemes in conjunction with Ferris. To dismiss him here, I will add that from his distant Canada residence we never had any positive intelligence of him, and were satisfied best that it was so. Inez, for the few days that Martha stayed with her, showed all her natural goodness and generosity. Was it stopped a little when she saw, with female quickness, the sentiment that had grown up between Martha and myself? If so, it made no difference in her treatment of the Quakeress, and she was one of the liveliest of the merry company at my wedding supper. Whether Mr. Thomas Peterson consoled the excellent and really fine-hearted girl, I cannot aver of my own knowledge, but it was evident that they rapidly became great friends with one another. With the advance of the season, too, Inez was busy in her preparations for a professional tour, she having engagements that way. This tour engrossed her time and attention, and proved, I understand, a very profitable one. Tom Peterson's friendship, the noble and always welcome young man, has not been lost to me by marriage. He is much engaged in his trade as a machinist, which he is enthusiastically fond of, and he has become invaluable to the proprietors of the large establishment where he was foreman. The establishment is now merged in the property of a company with far greater capital, and the business much enlarged and perfected, Tom being advanced to a station of still greater confidence and trust, with a handsome salary to back it. Although this responsible post fills up his time pretty well, Tom finds leisure of a Sunday to come out in the stage to the cottage where we, for I cut any further connection with the law, have settled ourselves at a little distance from the city and where we spend the summer. May your life be sunshiny, Tom Peterson, and the end of it a long while away. Ephraim Foster and Violet are well satisfied with all these developments, as, indeed, they are not easily induced to worry themselves with the course of affairs, so long as they have their health and a good living, and see their friends in the enjoyment of the same blessings. That beautiful philosophy! What a pity it is that we do not see more of it in this world of more imaginary than real troubles, great as the latter are. Ephraim, although years have passed with him since the period when he is first introduced in this narrative, is about the same old two and sixpence. He sticks to his provision and grocery store, which, as I remarked in a previous chapter, has superseded the original milk and sausage line, and laughs at me when I propose to him to accept any pecuniary help, and retire from public life. No, that he will not do at present, nor Violet either. They are very well satisfied, the employment just suits them, and the income is neither more or less than they want. And although no trust yet hangs up printed in white letters on a little dingy green board over the counter, Ephraim and Violet do trust, not only as much as in the early days, but a little more. Whenever the family is poor, or the father or mother sick, or when the appeal comes, as it often does from a helpless widow, or even the wife of an intemperate husband, 
then neither does Ephraim put on a frown nor a violet look the other way. The basket is silently heaped up, and there is no sulkiness to take away the blessing of the deed. Thus do these two cast their bread upon the waters in faith and true charity. And all they make no sanctimonious professions, will they not find it again returned to them after many days? Violet, I think, grows really beautiful as she approaches the latter part of middle age. She is still as stout, strong, and healthy as ever, and, most important fact of all, which I ought to have jotted down before, during the years that I have been recording the events of the past narrative, has presented her lord and master with two hardy boys, one of whom is six and the other three years old, the biggest being named Jack Engel Foster. The advent and growth of these plump and jolly little fellows, however, and the interest taken in them by father and mother, never subtracted a particle from my own portion. And as to Master Jack, who always showed a tenacious attachment to me, he spends nearly the whole summer at our cottage. I looked forward at an early date to the privilege of introducing him to some additional society. The young gentleman indeed teases me now and then on this subject, and asks me whether I will not hurry and make that little playfellow for him. I have no way of answering, except to assure the child that I will do my best, and that I confidently promise the gift to him in due time. The persevering youngster then asks me whether it has already begun, and will only be satisfied with my direct assertion to that effect. Nathaniel, too, and his canine friend are occasionally among my visitors. Nat grows in grace daily, and has found a much better situation than the one he held in Covert's office. He will make a fast man, this Nat, when he grows big enough. Calvin Peterson adheres faithfully to his professions, and continues to exercise his lungs at the revival meetings. I have before remarked that Calvin is a sincere worshipper in his own way, and that's more than can be said of many of the children of the church. Fitzmore Smythe and Ferris, some time afterward, commenced business under the firm of Ferris and Company, brokers. The last I heard of them was through a paragraph in the paper in which they were hauled up before a police court at the suit of a returned Californian for some semi-swindling. They paid their fine, quietly took the rebuke of the judge, and kept on as before. Barney and Nancy Fox regularly create an addition to the census with each recurring year. Barney, since he got started, has grown into a man of means and importance. He is a thorough hand at electioneering and possesses some advantages not commonly enjoyed in that profound science. There is even talk of putting Barney in nomination for quite an important municipal office. Madame Seligny, almost on the heels of Covert's sudden departure, went abroad, she said, for the purpose of taking possession of an inheritance. What truth there was in that part of the story I know not. But Rebecca accompanied her, and that forever broke up the pleasant intimacy between Tom Peterson and the pretty Jewess. With everything promising fair for a life of health and comfort, though no one can tell what the future may bring forth, with blessings on my lot, and on those who have stood my friends when I most needed them, with good humor toward all the world, a heart full of satisfaction, and pockets that do not flutter from lightness, Jack Engel here closeth the narrative of his life and adventures. End of chapter 22 Recording by Margaret Espyat End of Life and Adventures of Jack Engel An Autobiography by Walt Whitman